Thank you very much. That was, I really enjoyed uh, Professor Yeager's talk. I've been following his work for some time, and I can imagine more and more things. I think what I'm going to talk about today, obviously, the result will be we need better uh, chair side diagnostics. Uh, that, that's the conclusion. I'll give you right at the front. But I've been talking to you for six or seven years now about Kerry's risk assessment. And I'm going to go back to where we started, take us to where we are today, and talk about what's still needed. Because although we didn't get some of the results that perhaps we thought we might, I think it's clearly showing us where we need to go uh, for the next steps on, on Kerry's risk assessment, and specifically in uh, salivary testing for Kerry's risk assessment. This is the introduction to the talk I gave four years ago at this meeting, the next couple of slides, uh, to tell you what we planned so I can compare it to what we actually did. So we were talking then, when we just started the study, we were kicking it off. That was the kickoff announcement for this study. We now have two-year results, as you would expect, a little bit more than four years later because we looked retrospectively and we had to set the study up, et cetera, so it took some time to get going. Uh, a large study and one where we attempted to tackle one aspect of Kerry's risk assessment, that being salivary detection, and there are many, many other parts of this. So I'll give us a little background, uh, how we got here, we'll talk about the aims, we'll review the protocol that you know about, and I want to allow some time at the end to get interaction with you in terms of how you felt it went, because one part of the study that I'm not going to talk about, at least in terms of data today, is how it fit into the scheme of your office. And maybe we can just at least get a couple of comments about that, because one of the objectives of all these studies is not just the actual data that we produce, but logistically, how did this work in your office? I mean, there's data associated with that. Did it, did your, did it interact in the flow, with the flow of your patients effectively? Uh, did it work in terms of time and efficiency, et cetera? So we'll, we'll talk about those things. And you remember there was a lot of discussion about, th this is the study where we talked about reimbursements. It was the first one, I believe. We calculated the time it would take, and we had a pretty good algorithm to figure out how long it would take to do it, and then the compensation to the office based on that, because you know, we have to account for that time. And that was, you recall, done with this. As was mentioned yesterday by Tom, one of the, in terms of the priorities of the studies, this is the chart developed from your responses to a survey as to what studies you wanted to do. Cracks in teeth, we're going to hear about this afternoon, uh, was right at the top. These are statistically probably all similar, the top few. And then restoratives. Uh, and carries risk assessment. You see three and four, four and five are both on strategies for carries management and then salivary diagnostics being a specific subset of that. So this has been on our minds for a long time appropriately because we're inundated daily with information about carries risk. And there's a good reason for that as well. So let's go back to where we started back then and talk about the history of carries risk assessment for what is carries the most prevalent disease in humans. It affects about 99% of us in our lifetime, 98, 99%. And we still know very little about its prediction. Miller, who was the first sort of dental microbiologist, gave this definition of caries back in 1882. And if you read that definition, it's probably still pretty accurate today. We knew that caries was a process 140 years ago, yet we still don't treat it as a process for the most part because we can't identify its state early enough, we can't see it until there's a hole in a tooth, typically. So the most prevalent disease is not detected until the results of that disease, not the disease itself, are manifested. But we knew that 140 years ago. G.V. Black, who actually is the father of modern restorative dentistry, wrote three volumes. I have the actual volumes, and we get indoctrinated in dental school into volumes two and three with the cavity preparations. But volume one is actually about prevention and about how he loved caring for children, and he's saddened, those, that word was used, by the fact that you can't prevent this disease, and therefore we have to do these line angles and place these amalgams and things. <laughs> but really, even back then, it was discussed, it's too bad we can't identify this disease that is causing this way before we knew some of the things we knew today. But in the last several decades, the focus of dentistry has indeed shifted, shifted from entirely treating the results of this dental disease, which we're still doing for the most part, because we don't have a choice usually, we can't see it early enough, to uh, preventing the disease, water fluoridation being a great example, one of the most cost-effective public health measures of the last century, 
uh, except maybe in parts of Washington State where people are kind of anti that still. <laughs> I don't get it. I, I testified at, I, I told this story before, I testified at a water board, I think it was in Cedro Woolley, not to pick on that city. Some of you may be from up there. And I went and sat in front of their city council and their water board and I gave my 30 minute prepared statement with all the evidence as to why the water should be fluoridated. And their response was, what about our cattle? Or what about this or that? Nothing to do with what I just said. And I was thinking, there's something in the water here and it's not fluoride. <laughs> but anyway, this is the area we live in now. The area we live in now is uh, risk factor reduction. We all know in medicine, that's the practice of primary care medicine. You go to your doctor, you have an exam, they touch you, they feel you, maybe take blood, maybe in the future it'll be saliva, hopefully, uh, and they give you advice. Do more of this, do less of that, reduce your risk of disease. And we try to do that, but we just don't know exactly how to do it very well. But we have to get there, and that's really the purpose of the study we're trying to do. Why is that important from a cost standpoint? Caries is a very expensive disease. Dentistry in the U.S. is about, a, it's actually almost 110 billion now, I just saw the new numbers, so it's about 108, 110 billion dollar business. About 60% of that, or 60 plus billion dollars a year just in the U.S., that's about 150 billion worldwide, is treating the results of dental caries, which means most restorative dentistry, most prosthodontics, uh, most endodontics is the results of caries, not the disease. So caries is a 60 billion dollar disease, so if you Look at the cost of diseases uh, in the U.S. Uh, heart disease, number one, about 250 billion a year. Cancer, about 150 billion. And then you have lung disease and a few others at about 90 to 110 billion. Caries is about the fifth most expensive disease. It's about the same as all gastrointestinal disorders. So the fillings that we do, which are the results of that disease, not the disease itself, are very expensive. So you can see why one would want to look at the problem that led to that. We see this in our practice every day in one of the most affluent places in the world, in Seattle. We see kids walking in like this. We look on the lingual surface and we see that. And we still see two and a half year olds walking in like this in every place in the world. In fact, we see this more often here in the US than we do in developing countries because we have more sugar in our diet. I was in India recently and I was talking to the pediatric dentist there, growing number of them, and their operating room cases filling 15 teeth on two and a half year olds are on the rich kids, not the poor kids, because the poor kids don't have sugar. But guess what, they're getting sugar, just like they are in China and other places. We're gonna have a crisis on our hands as those places don't have access even near what we have here with our poor access until we solve the disease problem, which is the focus. And that's why you know, we see a hole, but we don't see it before that. That's the focus of the study. We have three or four kids walking in the hospital in every children's hospital every week with facial cellulitis from a cavity in a baby tooth. It's unbelievable that still occurs in 2012. That's his first visit to a dentist. So what do you think the lifetime experience is gonna be? So there are a lot of good reasons we need to know more about who is likely to get that. If that child at age one had six teeth, probably had his well baby checkup, had all the immunizations, looked pretty good, the six teeth looked fantastic. Almost always they look perfect, but 15, 20% of them end up with serious problems 18, two years later. That's kind of an extreme example. Jerry Sheesh, a prosthodontist, sent me this. These are some, I think, I recall they're called cast posts and core or something. Being a pediatric dentist, I don't remember that <laughs> from dental school that much. But they look pretty good to me from there, but then you look at them from the facial surface. And this patient had a reduction in saliva from radiation therapy. So we know that when you have radiation therapy, some dramatic impact occurs which reduces the saliva to a point where you get serious cavity problems right away. This occurred over a matter of months. It's like MRSA of the mouth, flesh-eating bacteria, kind of, I call it, you know. It's, uh, it's not methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, but it's a biofilm that's actually rapidly destroying the host tissue. Now, that doesn't occur with normal saliva. If I, I see a lot, I've treated a lot of special needs patients. Uh, I enjoyed hearing the fact that we want to learn more about that yesterday. And when I see a child walk in with, with some kind of complex special needs and I see them drooling, which is often the case, uh, that's all I need to know. You look in the mouth, I mean, this is anecdotal. This is my anecdotal finding. It's something I'd like to study. But in children who drool, you don't see caries. You know, parents want to put them on medications to reduce the drooling because it's inconvenient. 
But that bathing, that rinsing, saliva, saliva is your friend, I tell the parents. Saliva is the best friend. It's the most important thing. We just know very little about the elements of the saliva and the volumetric elements of the saliva and their impact. So we're, we li we're living in this world in the upper right quadrant. So if you imagine caries as a time-dependent process, which it is, right? What's the highest risk of caries, by the way? You've heard me ask this question before. Going to a new dentist. <laughs> because if you go to a new dentist, then they see your teeth in a static point in time with grooves as they look today, and they look sticky. And I tell the story of my sister who's moved around a lot. She's 51 years old. She has 28 permanent teeth. She had her third molars out, OK? <laughs> she has 28 permanent teeth, but she has very deep, very sticky grooves. She could walk around with 16 explorers in her premolars and molars and go like this, <laughs> and they wouldn't move. But you know, so if you look at them, it's kind of scary looking. And she doesn't even have any sealants. So uh, she goes to a new dentist, and invariably I get the phone call, you know, wow, I need to have a filling here or a, you know, a sealant or something. But if you look at it at a point in time, it's not terribly meaningful. It's a time-dependent process, but we don't have good predictors as to what that time-dependent process will reveal, hence the need for better detection devices and diagnostic devices. So we're living in this world in the upper right quadrant. That $60 billion of dentistry one of the most common diseases in the world, or one of the most expensive diseases in the world, I should say, the most common disease, is at a stage when the structural changes are not reversible. Where we have a hole, we have to do restorative dentistry. There's an entire world of dentistry here that we like to live in more, but we just can't reliably predict what that is. And that's what we're trying to, to get to. But uh, our studies here, which had very specific objectives, uh, we're a good step towards that. So we wanted to look at the caries risk uh, in permanent teeth. Uh, the first was to develop a caries risk assessment tool to predict caries. The second was to look at, uh, to see how it worked in the practice setting. That's what I told you before. We did, I'm not going to talk about that part today. And the third was, to, we're not going to talk about this today either. I'm only going to talk about the first one was to look at the relationship between certain medications which have salivary deprivation as a primary side effect. You know, if you look at the most commonly prescribed medications in the US, 80% of them have salivary deprivation as a major side effect. And so that, that will be discussed in other venues and posters and other publications. I'm only talking about the first one today. Going back, you know that you randomly selected uh, patients, and this was one of the studies in which we learned how to select patients, it was, so there were a lot of learnings from this second study that applied to other studies and selecting the X number of patient. These are the message, methods the patient filled out a questionnaire. The staff did the salivary test that was blinded to all of you, as you know. Uh, we reviewed the chart. The dentist performed an examination. That occurred at the baseline visit. And then at recall visits, there were exams. And then again, at the final follow-up, there were at, at the two-year time points, it was the end of the study, we did a chart review and more clinical exams. These are the measurements that you made, that your staff made in the office on the saliva, the consistency of the saliva, the flow rate from the labial salivary glands, the uh, pH of the saliva resting and then stimulated after chewing with wax, uh, and the buffering capacity and the flow rate. So can you produce, how much can you produce in a period of time? And then the buffering capacity. This was all done with a commercially available test kit. I'll get, come back to that. Um, and you remember we had the nice forms for you in which you copied all the data. And there was an incredible amount of information gathered. And I think they were pretty user friendly. I'll see what you think about that. But I think we did a pretty good job making it relatively easy to capture the information and to blind the salivary tests. Uh, I'm going to skip the compensation part and go on to the results here. So these are some of the, I'll call them preliminary results. This is as of uh, a couple of months ago. And I, I have to thank the entire team. I'm only the presenter. And I have to also give the statement that it's kind of tough to do a, the next few slides that are highly uh, dependent on good knowledge of biostatistics in the presence of probably 15 biostatisticians in the room, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I tried to get Joanna Scott to put a little walkie-talkie piece in my ear, and she wouldn't agree to do it, but OK. <laughs> so you can't blame her. You have to blame me. <laughs> um, so these are the characteristics of the patients, which resemble the patients in your practices in, in general, I think, because you randomly selected them. 
okay? And we intentionally recruited children, seniors, adults, and then senior adults, and that's the ratio on the left, male, female, uh, probably reflective of patients in your practices. I didn't go back and look at that. This is also probably reflective on the race characteristics of the patients, uh, primarily white, and uh, minorities mixed in in small amounts are missing. Some other statistics of the patients in your practices, uh, fluoride toothbrushing. You know, these questions were framed in a way we tried to capture it to make them sort of have high construct validity, but I, I can't say that there is some error just in the way the questions are phrased and the way the, the perhaps embarrassment level in some cases of a patient responding that they don't brush their teeth uh, as often as they should. It's pretty difficult to get accurate information on these kind of things. On the one on the right, it's a little misrepresented. It says that only 37% lived in a fluoridated community. We know that's about 70% nationally. And even in Washington State, it's, where it's low, it's about 60%. It's a little bit higher in Oregon and about the same 65 in the other states in, the, in precedent. But the unreported includes about, you know, uh, the, the unreported is about 30%. So if you add the 30% and assume that it might have actually been fluoridated, and you're probably close to that number. So we really don't know what, what that is. That'll come up later. So that's probably not a useful finding. So this compares previous caries lesions to new caries lesions. I'm gonna show you this again in a comparison chart with a correlation line in a moment. But on the left, you see the percentage of patients who had previous lesions, 71%, 52%, also had no caries lesions in the future. This is from the baseline. That's retrospectively, okay, we looked retrospectively at point zero, two years in the past, and then two years later, we looked how many incremental caries lesions were there. So you can right away see that history of caries lesions is a pretty good predictor, as we already knew. And then you can kind of look at the other numbers, one, two, and three lesions, and see it's pretty similar. This shows the same thing, but in a little more detail, with a chart of the x-axis showing Previous lesions, the y-axis, new lesions two years later. The dots are uh, based on the quantity of, of data at that point. So the density of the dot reflects the, the uh, density of the data. And you can see it's a moderate correlation. There's a lot of outliers there, but it's a moderate uh, correlation between history of caries and future caries. And we've known that from previous studies. Turns out in this study, it actually what is one of the best, better predictors relative to other things. So this is where we get into some of the uh, analysis. So our goal was to be able to predict future caries experience and to assess if the salivary measures uh, can predict successfully if the patient will develop new caries lesions. That's the simple objective. All these six things that we looked at in the saliva, does any one of them or perhaps combination of them predict future caries experience. Before we get into the saliva, let's look at some of the previously studied risk factors that we also accumulated in our study and to identify whether they alone, in the absence of the salivary analyses, predicted the future caries experience. So age, gender, et cetera, the diet. And on the diet one, interestingly, if you recall the literature search that we did and the things we presented to you, in previous studies, frequency of snacking behavior, especially for menable carbohydrates, obviously, is strongly related to caries experience. There are many studies that show when you really get a good reporting of snacking behavior for menable carbohydrates, that's obviously related to caries experience, okay? That's been shown well before. I'll show you what we found there. Uh, oral health status, number of teeth present, visible cavitation, et cetera, these are all things, plaque levels, deep pits and fissures, these are all things that we looked at these things and whether they live in the fluoridated community. Those are all things that have been associated somewhat in the past in other studies with future caries experience. But this is what we found. On the y-axis, you see the odds ratios. The bars represent 95% confidence intervals around a mean odds ratio. And these are the various uh, non-salivary factors that we collected. So if you look at the first one is uh, sweet drinks and snacks. So the one before that I said was snacking behavior that has previously been reported as having a very strong relationship to future caries as an odds ratio of one. No, no relationship whatsoever, no, no predictive value whatsoever for that. Uh, cavitation, which means uh, a hole in a tooth, did have a significant predictive 
uh, factor, which you would expect, and then even more so on overall caries experience, the history of caries, as you saw on the previous pie chart, in our study indeed had a highly significant relationship with an odds ratio of two and a half to predict future caries experience. Plaque on teeth was not predictive, and then the use of fluoridated toothpaste was predictive in the sense that it reduced caries risk, as you see there, as you would expect, but again, the data there has to be cleaned up to really know who, how much fluoride toothpaste and, of course, the other fluoride situation. It gets pretty complex, but at least it did show that. And then where they lived in the Florida community, of course, is confounded by the fact that we don't know actually who lived in the Florida community, as I showed you before. So you can kind of reject that last one. If you add now the salivary factors into the mix, uh, just looking at them in isolation now, and their predictive ability, you can quickly look at this and see that the bars, these 95% confidence intervals of the odds ratios for all six of the salivary factors are below the line. Therefore, there's really no predictive value. <laughs> I mean, in summary, they, they don't, they're not reliable tests in the way in which we use them for this test. Okay, I'm gonna, that's gonna be discussed in a moment. It doesn't mean these tests aren't valuable because, as I'll jump to right away, you also recall from our uh, literature review going into this, that there have been a lot of tests, that have, a lot of studies that have looked at some of these elements and future carries experience. And if you take buffering capacity, for example, which we thought, based on the literature, would be one of the most predictive, those buffering capacity tests were done with laboratory analyses of buffering capacity, where we took a sample of saliva, brought it to the laboratory, and with elegant, sophisticated techniques that didn't uh, corrupt the ability to perform the test chair side in a short time with the constraints that we would like, that we have in the, in, the, in the dental operatory, there was a highly predictive value of buffering capacity. But when you take a commercially available kit, which may not function in the same way exactly, we did not see that. Okay, that's one example, just to show you a distinction of what had been shown before and what we showed here. So now you can get into some of the more uh, analyses. I'll spend just a couple minutes on uh, logistic regression and see uh, in terms of the actual sensitivity, specificity. Uh, you have this on the handout. I'm going to move on in the interest of time here to allow us to have a short discussion at the end. But we're actually, our goal is to see what's the right balance of sensitivity and specificity we want to end up with. So a, a good predictor will give us, of course, a high sensitivity and a high specificity. Uh, there are a lot of things we have in dentistry today for risk assessment that are very sensitive but poorly specific. In fact, most of the, the, develop, the environmental and uh, social tools that we use to predict caries, like the caries risk assessment tool from the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the ADA's risk assessment tool, the Canberra tool out of California, all of those are highly sensitive and not very specific. They elicit way too many people is having this disease. And well, you could say, well, that's not a problem. At least we find out who they are. But the cost of treating all those people aggressively, which you'd like to do with a person who's truly at high risk, to a third party payer would be prohibitive. So the goal for all of us is to identify as closely as possible who actually gets the disease. Take the children going under general anesthesia at age three who looked perfect at age six months or one year with six teeth. That's a perfect model. Almost every child's teeth look perfect at one year. They all go to the pediatrician, six teeth, they look beautiful. But somehow, depending on the population and where you are, 18 to 20% of them end up with early childhood caries 18 months later, affecting 10 or 15 teeth. They're in the operating room having general anesthesia. 18 months later, they look perfect, all of them, 100%. So the best test would be one that told me exactly who those kids are before they get to the operating room. And don't show me any of the ones that aren't gonna end up there. That's the test we want. And the same thing for adult disease and uh, the caries we experience elsewhere. So we do these models to look at sensitivity. And this is just the mathematical method of, of creating sensitivity, where we want to have only true positives and no false negatives. If we take other examples of things that are, sent, that are very insensitive for risk assessment, but very specific, bite-wing radiographs. Okay, bite-wing radiographs are extremely insensitive. You can't see anything on an x-ray until it's about halfway through the enamel. So you can't see the early lesions at all. It doesn't detect anything. But if you see it, it's a cavity. <laughs> so it's very specific, but it's very insensitive. So we have, we have a lot of things that are very sensitive, not specific. We have some things that are very specific and not sensitive. We don't have both. We hope that saliva uh, might be the answer to that. So I'm saying the same thing here. 
we want 100% sensitivity. If we have 80% sensitivity, you're going to reliably identify 80%, but you're going to miss 20% of those people. The specificity, again, to reiterate, is to make sure that we're not getting any noise, that we're actually only picking up those patients who are going to get lesions and not identifying those with not. And you, you can understand the implication, being a very expensive disease, if we suddenly define a tool that's claimed to be very sensitive and specific, but it's not very specific, but the objective is to do aggressive intervention that's more expensive, see patients much more often, maybe up to six times a year and do some aggressive home care, more products, more pharmaceuticals, that's going to rise the cost significantly initially if we identify too many people. So we have to come to that result before we can really rapidly implement or quickly implement a, a, a reliable risk assessment tool that's going to be paid for, okay? So specificity means that we're going to only pick up, we're going to pick up all the ones that are there but not any noise, any false positives. We want a highly specific and highly sensitive. Uh, our biostatisticians can do these uh, uh, receiver operator characteristic curves that will compare, in this sense, how does the sensitivity and specificity relationship under different scenarios compare, for example, here to flipping a coin? You know, you could just flip a, some of the tests we have today, you're actually better off flipping a coin. Uh, to determine the likelihood of caries than you are using this expensive device. And I'm not going to get into that part, but that's some other work that's not about this study. But you can see that the uh, area under the curve, 0.67, you want it to be 1 would be the ideal sensitivity and specificity. Okay, it's 0.67, you want it to be 1. 0.67 is not bad if you compare the sensitivity and specificity overall, but if you, that's without, this is without the saliva tests, but the point I want to make here is if you add the salivary analyses, you can quickly look at those two curves, there's no additional benefit of the saliva in predictability. So in our particular study, we did not find an additional benefit of the saliva. Um, and this shows the overall sensitivity and specificity predictability, therefore, um, of this test. It wasn't very sensitive at all. It was a lot more specific but not very sensitive, and pretty much the same without the salivary factors and with them. So highly specific tests in our case, but not very sensitive. So we're missing a lot of disease with our tests, which is different than some of the other environmental historical tests that are available to us. So just quickly, uh, my observations, and I think your questions or comments are quite useful. This is going to obviously open up other discussions. Why were our associations so weak? And that, of course, related to that, the limitations of this study. Um, if we get more data and we're not finished, we're, we're going to collect data until the end of April, and I understand we'll have another 100 or so subjects. Not likely to change the results in talking to my colleagues in this instance, so we're probably going to end up where we are today or pretty close to that, and what to do next. So my take is that uh, the ability, first of all, on the, on the salivary test that we used, the kit that we used, it was, I think we did find that it was useful in the sense that people used it. and. Unless I, I, I'm hearing from you that it actually worked pretty well, the staff was able to do it, although in the case of the buffering capacity specifically, as Marilyn in a previous study showed, and we showed in this one as well, that it was difficult to articulate the color of the, of the strips, and what was actually reported were colors that weren't even there, and we found all kinds of things that were probably inaccurate. So it wasn't a very repeatable test. And that probably resulted in a lot of the error associated with the buffering capacity, which I said had been shown with a laboratory uh, measured buffering capacity to be highly predictive of future carries experience. So it may just be that this commercially available kit, which had not been tested that much, may not be the right device to use for our salivary testing. It could be that. Uh, because there is association from previous studies, but again, in complex laboratory-based tests that are cumbersome and uh, obstructive enough that they likely would not be used in offices. So we got to figure out a way, and that's why I enjoyed listening to Professor Yeager's talk. So that's my email, <laughs> is this. <laughs> we have so much in dentistry, you know, we got the largest disease, $60 billion here. If, we could, if I could just take the kids or even take the subset of kids and check their saliva one year in a pediatrician's office where they all go and tell me which 20% are going to end up in the operating room, with some saliva, and we probably could, we just don't know how, <laughs> and, and find out how to intervene and on whom. Uh, I'll stop with that, and time for a few questions for the break, please.
Actually, this is uh, the first time that um, I've seen some of this data, so just thinking off the top of my head about uh, what to conclude from this. I, you know, many of these tests that we've done have been shown in other publications to be associated with carriage risk. And so one question is why, why isn't it showing up here? And one of the things we were trying to do in this study is to look at several of these issues at once and take into account other things like um, previous carries experience and demographic factors as well, all at the same time. And I think what may have happened with uh, some of these uh, factors in the past, if you look at one at a time and you don't take into account the fact that a measure uh, of that one variable may also be associated with a lot of other things like previous carries experience and other kinds of socioeconomic factors and that sort of thing, you get, you see an association. But the question is, is that any, does it provide any kind of independent information aside from what you already know? Right. And I think some of that is going on here. Some may be um, the lack of precision of some of these in-office tests as well. But from that point of view, I think what's important is to see, we wanted to look at what kind of information you could get in your office at the time of a visit to tell if there was carries risk, if there was elevated risk for carries. And what I'm seeing here is that these tests don't seem to provide that kind of useful information. Maybe something more precise um, will do that. Um, but these tests so far don't seem to provide um, useful additional information. There's a lot of information already in which you know about the, the patient, what their previous carries experience was, for example. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll leave it open for your questions and comments. While we're getting the mic over there, I'll just make one comment before the mic gets to the first question, and that is other work related to this I think is very important is not what I would call carries risk assessment, but actually early detection because it's a process. So if we had a device in the pediatrician's office, for example, on that child, that you could actually see the process sub subsurface at age one on that continuum, that's actually very early detection as opposed to the best form of risk assessment. So that's another parallel area of work we're looking at. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, saliva has been looked at since I was in dental school over 30 years ago. The last 10 years, the new uh, buzzword we've been hearing is biofilm. Anything on biofilm that is predictive that you're aware of or working on? Well, I'm, no, I'm certainly no expert in biofilms. I've been, I've, I've been in contact, and I still am, with a lot of experts looking at that, and they're looking at a variety of things, including the messaging and quorum sensing and looking at how to uh, control the difference between the planktonic stage and the biofilm stage. So there is a lot of work going on that's related to this in the sense that you extract the sample using saliva. So there's, you know, there's a guy here named David Stahl in uh, microbiology who's, who's, who was doing some work with these microarrays. I think he's kind of temporarily suspended for funding reasons, but looking at some of the bugs that you can't cultivate. So that's a whole area of the biofilm that we know nothing about, essentially, the two-thirds of the bugs in the mouth that we can't grow. So we have no idea what they do. We only know they're there and in what quantity. So uh, I'm no expert, but there is a lot of work going on there that's not directly related to this. But saliva is obviously the carrier. So those results were looking at those various factors in isolation. Oh, over oh, here. there. Hi. Um, did, have you analyzed that, or can you analyze our data to look at combinations? So if you have a low buffering capacity and a low flow and something else, does that combination of factors then become mm. predictive? I think we did do that. Joanna, are you there? Where's Joanna Scott? They were all analyzed, yeah. So those were all looked at simultaneously. Yeah. So yeah, those saliva results that we saw were looking at all the saliva measures at one time together. There was no, it was no added they value by the combination either. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, those were the prediction models that you were evaluating. Right. Uh, and that, that included all those things. Included all the time. combinations. The regression included all the combinations. Back here. Um, so are there factors in the saliva chemistry that are uh, known to be effective against caries? Well, there, there certainly are likely to be because in laboratory studies, uh, you know that you need not just fluoride, but, well, you don't need fluoride, actually. You need calcium and phosphate, and there's a whole debate about, and this relates to, to Greg's presentation yesterday in the white spots. Maybe the reason that the 
MI paste doesn't work is because it doesn't add any value because you already have enough calcium and phosphate, you don't need more. So <clears throat> we know very little about that, you know, what, what the dynamics of what the electrolytes in the saliva are. Obviously, we know they're extremely important because when you eliminate saliva, caries just goes crazy. So you need the elements of saliva, the electrolytes in saliva, to prevent disease, all those different substances. But we know very little in vivo about it. We know something in vitro. So, hi. Yeah. Uh, the question I have is the first statement you made when you started the... And this is a statement you always make, is a chemical parasitic process. Is what, I'm sorry? The G.V. Black's definition of yeah, caries. Yeah, The chemical and parasitic process. Yeah, that's so Miller's we, definition, yeah. Oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> Anyways, so we, we have been studying the chemical part of it, but we didn't do any tests for the parasitic part of it, right? You mean here in this study? Yes. No, we didn't, we didn't look at bugs. Yes. That's correct. So would that be the best way to go about in predicting? It gets very complex. Some are believers in that. But again, if you look at the people who are looking at these bugs that you can't cultivate, they might tell you that strep mutans, for example, which is the primary culprit that we say, uh, may be more aciduric than acidogenic, and it might just be there because there is decay uh, or because there is acid produced by another bug. So again, in the in vivo situation, we just don't understand the biofilm to the extent that we should, although there are some believers in doing those tests, which are quite expensive, I should say. And, and, again, and even in that situation, if you run these ROCs on those, the added value, what I've seen before, it doesn't add that much. I haven't seen a significant difference by adding it in. In isolation, you can show that it has some effect, some predictive value. Well, thank you very much, Joel. Uh, we uh, will now take a 30-minute uh, coffee break and then come back to talk about uh, cracked teeth and the new and the new national network. Thank you.